Okay, welcome back everyone. This is theCUBE's live coverage in Monaco. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Uh, we're here at the Monaco Crypto Summit getting all the action around what's going on on the platform, the NFTs, the metaverse. Uh, the role of society is going to be decentralized. Coming, it's coming fast for everybody. And we're going to be covering like a blanket as we always do. And we've got a great guest, Beth Kaiser, who is the co-founder of Own Your Own Data Foundation, among other great accolades, um, pillar of the industry. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely, Love thank you so much for having data, me. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> sign on your body. You know, it's, it's, it's important to keep the message uh, as obvious as possible for everyone every single day. Well Beth, I'm really glad you're here. I first want to congratulate you on a great journey you've been on. It's been a, a roller coaster, I know. Uh, you've done amazing pioneering work around own your own data, going back to the Wyoming days, and, and then looking at decentralization as an opportunity. Uh, as well, and now we've seen that play out years later. You were involved in the Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal, being in there, seeing it, and, and whistleblowing that out and sharing that, the, those exploits. Um, quite a thrust into the center of the conversations at that time, it's become very political. So you had, you're, you're driving positive change over here, and then you get caught over here and you're driving change over there. What's it been like? I mean, it's been an incredible journey uh, over the past four and a half years since, um, I, I suppose, going full time into blockchain around 2017, but really, uh, you know, moving to the state of Wyoming uh, in January 2018 to begin what has been the most successful legislative initiative ever in the United States, as well as the most successful legislative initiative for uh, distributed ledger technology in the digital asset industry. Uh, from there, I, I really feel like it's been quite an incredible journey. Uh, it's always uh, a roller coaster in different industries and especially when you become yeah. a whistleblower. But I think what has been really the truth is trying to explain to people how data protection, how transparency and tracking and traceability that we don't get from legacy technology is actually enabled by yeah. crypto, enabled by a new form of cryptography that is decentralized and immutable. And, and that really has been such an incredible transition that I think legislators and regulators around the world are finally starting to understand. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and again, I just can't just over amplify the work that you're doing and how important it is because one of the big societal changes right now is culture mm -hmm. and the culture clash of how laws are made, how business is done, are all collapsing and they're changing. And so the generation of leaders that we need in the, around the world got to step up because the people there now aren't that tech savvy, they're lawyers. <laughs> so there's nuances around privacy and data protection and governance by jurisdiction, by applications, by your presence. I mean, it's, it could be complicated for someone who's like in power. <laughs> who doesn't even know what the internet is. Uh, absolutely, I mean, some of the legislators and regulators that I've sat down with, uh, they really start at the beginning, you know, like, can we define a, a, a database? What does data actually mean? What does it look like? Uh, what can you do with it? Before I can get to advanced predictive algorithms and quantum resistant encryption. So uh, obviously sometimes the understanding is, uh, you know, at a 10,000 foot level, but if you can explain to people yeah how these technologies will help improve their lives and improve the lives of their constituents. That's really how I found that we can yeah. connect on another level where they actually understand what the implementation can do. And then when we show them case studies of exactly yeah. how this has been implemented successfully across you know, agriculture and digital identity and land titles and all yeah. of these different things that are usually hard to solve for in government that we have been able to do this so successfully, that's when we really get the buy-in. You know, before I flew into Monaco on Tuesday, I was in Boston covering the Amazon Web Services Reinforce, which is their security conference. Now, AWS is very popular, everyone knows what they are in cloud computing, but the security teams in the, around the world have a different ethos. And it's, you can see, that. I want to get, get your reaction to this comment, because what I noticed in Missouri, you mentioned crypto resistance. It's pretty well known that quantum is going to powerful capability. I'm sorry, quantum resistance. Cryptography can be hacked. So there's all movements afoot around shared responsibility um, and this quantum resistance and encryption. And people are generally afraid of it because of the keys. And that's what I walked with the general public. But now you see the security professionals coming together and they're all kind of saying it out loud most of the times, but not saying it out loud enough that the future is really going to be decentralized. Okay. How, how far are we along in the mainstream, in your opinion, of the tipping point where everyone gets it? 
<laughs> are we like way miles away? Are we close? It feels like we're getting closer, but like not close enough. And like I get kind of frustrated. But like, what's your reaction to that? Uh, I would say uh, it, it really depends which part of the world you're in. But if you're just going to look at an average, I would say we're getting to at least like 10 to 20 percent of people who can really understand how these technologies work and are actually starting to use them now. Those numbers are not bad given how young these technologies are and how young the industry is in general. And so I think we're going to see a really steep. Uh, climb of how many people are getting involved over the next couple of years because it was only during the coronavirus shutdown when everyone started to lead a fully digital life where they realized, well, if I can't go into my bank or if I can't do this in person, then what am I supposed to do? And they started to think about, okay, well, some technologies are actually not even that convenient and some industries are not even very digital. And so the only way to actually live life in a more successful way is to have a comprehensive digital uh, strategy that yeah. brings in decentralization yeah. uh, to make sure that things can still function yeah. even when we're in crisis. And you know, it's not just the coronavirus pandemic, it's also been shown in the recent yeah. uh, war with Ukraine where all of a sudden yeah. nearly everyone in the country is using cryptocurrency because it's uh, the banks don't work in a situation like this. Uh, you mentioned Ukraine, is a quick, quick plug for the work you're doing there real quick. I know you've done some things there. Can you share what you're working on? Because there's a lot of people leaving Ukraine, looking for jobs, so folks out there, hire Ukraine engineers. I've been promoting this in Silicon Valley. If you got openings, people look, with their families have nothing. Uh, so they're looking for jobs. I know you've done some work there. Can you share a quick plug? Of course. Uh, so there's two main projects uh, that I've been working on in Ukraine since uh, the start of the war. One was to help launch Aid for Ukraine, which uh, has been the largest humanitarian aid fund in Ukraine. It's all in cryptocurrencies, and that was really because in the beginning of the war, we knew a lot of governments were going to hesitate yeah. to put money yeah. in Ukraine because they didn't want to escalate tensions with Russia. Now, individuals that don't represent sovereign nations all around the world giving in cryptocurrency doesn't escalate tensions because yeah. it's not money coming from a country. Oh, so It's funny, isn't it? it oh. It's incredible. <laughs> it's, it's like, come on, just get the cash over there. Come on. Gee, right? Help. But, you know, the European Union yeah. was first yeah. and it took them nearly two and a half weeks to yeah. send any money, whereas all of the first yeah. money that was being used on medical kits and night vision goggles and food yeah. rations was being bought with Bitcoin and Tether. So Aid for Ukraine, which you can find at donate.thedigital.com .gov.ua uh, is a place where you can use every cryptocurrency, including digital bits. Um, uh, well, it, it's 16 official cryptocurrencies right now, with, with yeah. more being added in order to donate. And the second big project is called HeritageHub.org, and Heritage Hub is uh, basically um, a, a community of all these different top-level technologies around the world that we're using in order to preserve cultural heritage. A lot of this includes everything from 3D drone scanning to robots, hand scanners, where we're documenting all of the national monuments, all of the historic grade listed buildings from UNESCO and the Ministry of Culture, as well as the antiquities, artifacts, and art inside of museums. So that one, the blockchain says that these things came from Ukraine. So if anything is destroyed or looted, we know where yeah. to get it back to. Yeah. Uh, secondly, in case anything is further destroyed, at least we have an exact digital blueprint in order to recreate it and rebuild. Uh, uh, and of course, also we can use metaverse uh, and crypto-enabled business models in yeah. order to raise money to rebuild the physical buildings and the World yeah. Heritage sites that have already been destroyed. That's, well, this is exactly why I love the conversation. What you just laid out, first of all, it should be mind-blowing people who aren't in the weeds here with us, but that is exactly what community is all about. One, moving fast, no bottlenecks, so speed, mm -hmm. besides all the other benefits of you know, immutability, speed of movement, moving fast, mm -hmm. no middleman, red tape, bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, two, just the preservation of the assets is in another new, you know, really kind of grows out of this where NFT is now and mm -hmm. kind of the, the connected the dots to the future. It's not just about the cartoon or whatever, and that's an identity, it's cool and fun, art is art, is great. But when you start getting to these practical purposes, you're having play, but this is reality. This is actually societal impact. And I think that's what I'm getting out of this next wave is, yeah, there's some, you know, stuff's going to go under, <laughs> bad ideas out of the way, but growth is growth, but there's still total viability. Absolutely, and uh, I think during times of market downturns or, or bear markets is when you start to see 
uh, the best ideas being implemented because it's something that has real world utility, something where governments or companies have not completely solved the problem yet. And so we have the ability to go in, find a problem that, that is really big and that not enough work or money has been uh, invested into investigating it so far. And so we're able to actually use new technologies that didn't exist the, the last time this big problem arrived uh, to solve it in new ways and really do it quickly and and do it in a way where the entire world can participate, and I think that's what's so exciting. Beth, you're an inspiration. Mm -hmm. I really love chatting with you. Um, great insights, uh, great smarts and brains, uh, and you're getting down and dirty, making things happen. F fantastic work and continue to do it. Uh, I have to ask you, while you're here, um, what was it like um, to, to go through that Cambridge Analytica thing, because you know, they made a movie about it, right? <laughs> and so. You know, I mean, that's not something you wake up and you put on, you think you want to do in your life, is that that's going to happen, but you know, that's a critical moment in history. It is super important note, it's a cautionary tale, as well as an example of exploitation that you, you saw with others, said, hey, whoa, what was it like? Tell, take, me, take me through that real well, quick. Well, I got into data science specifically um, because I believed that data science was going to be the quickest way and the most um, efficient way to solve a lot of global problems and to also be able to run impact campaigns, human rights initiatives in a more transparent and effective manner. Uh, now, when I joined Cambridge Analytica, it was specifically to uh, learn how we could use early warning systems to prevent war, prevent crisis, prevent uh, famine even, uh, but anything that can be detected that it's going to happen with data. Enough behavioral data, enough social media data, and you can tell something's going to happen before it does. Now, when I was there, I learned a lot more about data than I expected, mm -hmm. and a lot more about the fact that data can be used by anyone for any purposes, any technology can. And so we, we didn't actually have enough protections in the industry to stop bad actors yeah. from abusing these technologies. So that's really where, for me, whistleblowing was not an easy decision to make, but something where I felt like I, I needed to do it and that there was an entire industry behind me yeah. of people who were trying to solve the problems yeah. of legacy big tech. There were already so many privacy campaigners around the world. There were already yeah. uh, a huge crypto industry where people were saying, okay, lack of transparency, centralization, abuse of yeah. data, all of this um, is a huge problem and we're trying to fix it. So for me, yeah. I knew that I had other industries to yeah. go to after becoming a whistleblower and that I had people that would support me in what I was doing yeah. and relay the message by actually building technologies that solve the problems of legacy tech. Well, we thank you, we support you because and what you illustrated to the world was, and, uh, and we were yelling from our blog on Silicon Angle about this, is that when you have tech for good, there's tech for bad, okay? And you made that publicly aware, and that's a, uh, a contribution, I think, that'll be looked at as one of the major things in history. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming on theCUBE, and uh, mm -hmm. great to see you in person. Again, love your own data, the users are in charge. <laughs> Once the users get their data, good things can happen, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and so if anyone uh, wants to learn more, you can follow me at Own Your Data Now on Twitter or reach out to me at info at ownyourdata.foundation. Where are you going to be next? Give a plug on your schedule. Do you have any insight into what you're going to, people can rendezvous with you? And, yeah, uh, I mean, if anyone's in Colorado, I'm heading to Future Shape 360 next, uh, then a United Nations conference in New York then Burning Man, <laughs> and then uh, United Nations General Assembly Week, uh, we'll be doing a lot of work for the Ukraine projects when everyone around the world descends upon New York, so All definitely right. see me there. Get involved, join Beth's mission and her team and, and community. A lot of great stuff happening and decentralization. Like I said, it's coming everywhere. It's a force for good and you got to watch out on all the other sides as well. This is Cube's coverage here at the Crypto Conference, Monaco Crypto Summit. I'm John Furrier, your host. We'll be back with more live coverage after this short break. <laughs>